Okay, First Thessalonians 1 and then Hebrews 6. Both of them have a identical phrase. And I hope this will be an encouragement this morning. First Thessalonians 1. And uh, let's go ahead and pray before we get started. Spirit of God, I pray that you'd be our teacher and guide. I pray that the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ would be uh, soaking us right now, that uh, there'd be no hindrances, that uh, might have experience uh, biblical inspiration, that we might understand the words and help us to uh, determine in our heart that there will be nothing between my soul and the Savior, and that uh, we can faithfully... Uh, serve uh, you and others, uh, even behind the scenes. I pray you'd help us be faithful in that task. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all. I'd say down south, y'all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Okay, that's the phrase I want to look at this morning. Labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came... Not unto you in the word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. See, that's, a, that's not a bad thing if the person's following the Lord. Having received the, the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Okay, then uh, Hebrews 6, the same, same phrase, identical phrase is used in Hebrews. <clears throat> Doctrinally, we know 1 uh, Thessalonians is something that's addressed to us and it is for us. So it's for us and to us. Hebrews 6 is addressed for us, but it's not addressed to us. But still the idea is the same. It's pretty universal. Hebrews 6, verse 9. Okay, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, the you would be the Hebrews, and the things that accompany salvation through though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Okay, there's that phrase I'm looking at, labor of love, which you have showed toward his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. That's the labor of love, the ministering to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do, uh, you do show the same diligence to the first full assurance of hope unto the end. Okay, the end of what? Tribulation time period. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises, that would be the millennial promises. But still, in verse 10, the idea, it's kind of a universal thing. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Now, man forgets it often, but God doesn't. And it's when you minister to the saints. Okay, and so the idea this morning is uh, quiet, unsung heroes of the faith. Okay, quiet, unsung heroes of the faith. Uh, People often overlook or don't even know about unsung heroes of life, okay? They often know about the well-known heroes, okay? They know about the well-known heroes. We know about them, but we don't know about the unsung heroes, many multitudes of people that do things and operate that the well-known hero gets the credit for. For every well-known hero, there are hundreds of unsung heroes. The well-known hero often gets the credit or the uh, glory, I guess you could say, or in this life where the unsung hero is not even recognized. But there's a God in heaven that recognizes the unsung hero. Now, technically, to be really honest about this as far as 
if a person is to choose to be an unsung hero or a well-known hero, really the choosing is not up to us. That's up to the Lord. But the unsung hero gets, in this idea, gets the credit and the glory at the judgment seat, where the well-known hero often gets some credit now and, in, in essence, kind of forfeits some at the judgment seat. But it, it is the Lord that decides who's going to be the well-known hero and the unsung hero. Okay, many of the unsung heroes quietly work to provide success to the well-known. But God is the one in Hebrews 6.10 that says, He is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He is keeping accurate accounts. God is the one keeping those accounts. And then He will reward accordingly. Now, we live in a Hollywood age, TV age, and Hollywood gives a false perception of life. And that's all they do, a false perception. And people that watch Hollywood and the media and the things of life, it's hard to get away from this false perception. What is a false perception that Hollywood portrays? That life is excitement all the time. You go from one excitement to another excitement, from one excitement, and in, like the Japanese portrayed American television, it is bang, bang, and smack, smack. And what they're saying by that is bang, bang, all excitement, smack, smack, love, you know, all that stuff. That's how Japanese portray the American television. And that's true of American television. But that's not life. When a person realizes that most of life is sag, bag, and drag. And the older you get, you tend to enjoy the sag, bag, and drag. You're tired of the excitement. Okay. And you got to realize that's life. And that's where the unsung heroes really thrive when you don't get the credit and the glory. Now, this has, in, this has come into the church. You can see that. And now, what is the catch word that most church uh, pastors will be using to draw a crowd? The word is exciting. Oh, exciting. I got on YouTube and just wanted to check out the guy down there in a Wheatfield area. And he's, he's going to do this video, he's going to do this series, for, and he says right off the this is going to be exciting. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat. Oh, getting ready to hit the delete button. And he's not, not even in 60 seconds, oh, this is going to really be exciting. What's going to be exciting? Me sitting on my butt watching, you rapidly math, you throwing some pictures on the screen. Oh, that's exciting. And people nowadays can't sit down and listen and think because their attention spans about five seconds. Why? Because Hollywood has conditioned us. Everything's got to be exciting. Hey, changing a diaper of a six, uh, six months old, you know, where the, the, the uh, disease came through the diaper and is leaching, that's exciting. Right. You know, when my wife wouldn't want to go to place, and you know, she'd be watching kids. I said, babysitting. She said, no, no, no. It's dads do not babysit. That's your child. <laughs> right. Well, one of them times when she was gone, one of them had it coming out of the sides of the diapers. And so all I did, I just whipped it off, and I turned on the bathtub thing, and I just stuck the rump right underneath there and excitingly watched it all flow down to the bottom. You know, that's how you take care of that stuff. I mean, exciting. No, life is when you, really life is when you grab hold of the routine maintenance. And you, en and you begin to enjoy the routine maintenance, the care and maintenance of life, the boredom of life. That's what a person's got to grab onto. When we're in Colorado, the young people, a lot of times, of course, they've been conditioned. And a couple times, a few times, they'd say, well, I'm bored, okay? You've got to have some activity, to, you know, to make things exciting. And they'd say, well, I'm bored. And I'd say, you're bored because you are a boring person. And then I said, just enjoy quietness. No, what do you got to do? You got to take the kid to Six Flags so he can go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's not exciting to me to stand in line for an hour and an hour and a half for two-minute thrill. 
I mean, especially when a credit card's been checked at the gate, and when you come out, the limit is all the way, all the way up. That I mean, I don't get excitement out of that. But the world has conditioned us that way, and this is what's caused people not to appreciate the quietness and the mundane things of life. Oh, my life's not significant. It's not important. Oh, yeah, it is. Why? Because Jesus Christ died in Calvary for you. That's where the excitement comes right there. And this has come into the, the colleges, the Christian colleges, where they get these young guys out and they want to have a big church because that's exciting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, what comes with a bunch of people comes with a bunch of, yeah, what comes, just like if you get a bunch of hogs, what comes with a bunch of hogs is, you know, something that's in the pig pen, you know, exciting. No, life, most of life is sag, bag, and drag, and a person needs to embrace that and learn to enjoy those things. Take a walk in the woods, okay, not in this kind of weather, but take a walk in the woods and enjoy the quietness, and look at God's creation. Okay, popular or well-known heroes really get there because there are hundreds of unsung heroes below them, if you want to use that term, below them. And a common, there's a common saying, behind every successful man is a great woman. Well, we can kind of change that. Behind every successful man is a surprise mother-in-law. Okay, but... Uh, I mean, you got all those in there. Uh, but if you look at sports in football, the unsung heroes are the offensive linemen. They don't give an MVP trophy to the center, to the guard, to the tackle. Who does it go to? Usually the little skinny guy behind them that he's protecting and maybe one of the fullbacks or running backs. He rarely goes to a wide receiver. It always goes in that. But that quarterback could not survive them 300 big gorillas come across the line if these 300-pound gorillas on this side keeps them away at bay. Those are the unsung heroes. Uh, Neil told me about uh, one yesterday where the running back was trying to get in a touchdown and he was just stopped, couldn't go, and the center just grabbed him and threw him across the line. So he handed the center the ball and let him spike it. Now, that's an unsung hero, but who gets credit for the, the touchdown? Not the center, it's the running back. Okay, and in basketball, in basketball, usually a team, if they have three or four alpha dogs, it ain't going to work. They're going to be button heads with each other. Usually got to have a chemistry in there. And the same goes true in a lot of areas of life. Common saying I can remember hearing growing up is, we got too many chiefs and not enough Indians. People say, well, that's racist. Tough apples, just deal with it. Don't get affected by the news media. But it's true. It's true. You need one good chief and many Indians to develop a good, successful tribe. But the thing about man is man often overlooks the unsung heroes. Man often forgets it. But we have a God in heaven that keeps track. And Hebrews 6, verse 10 says, He will not forget our labor of love. Now, sometimes, and many times, you'll find a well-known hero, but that well-known hero for years before became a well-known hero was an unsung hero. He served quietly behind the scenes, and then God elevated him. And a perfect example of many in the Bible. We have many well-known heroes that we know of, but they served faithfully before they were well-known. Joseph. Served his dad, served Potiphar, sir, and then served Pharaoh. But the only reason we know about Joseph is because he faithfully served as an unsung hero until God elevated him. Joshua. The reason why we know about Joshua is because God elevated him. But before Joshua became a well-known hero, he was an unsung hero behind the scenes ministering to Moses for years, for I don't know how many years, at least 20 Joshua served him. David served Saul behind the scenes until Saul got all bent out of shape. And then he became a fugitive. Okay, and then God took Saul out of the way and then elevated David. Elisha 
served his father as a farm kid. He was plowing in the back 40, and while he was plowing, Elijah was looking for somebody to replace him to take over after he's gone. So he didn't go to the college seminaries. He didn't go to the seminaries. He didn't go to the colleges. He didn't go where the people were well known. He went to the back 40, and he found Elisha was plowing back there. And he said, uh, Elisha, I want you to help me out. And Elisha served under Elijah for a brief time, and then God evaluated, uh, exalted Elisha in due time. Daniel served Babylon. The only reason we know about Daniel is because God recorded that. Timothy served Saul, or Paul. If you would, look in Proverbs chapter 17 and then also Galatians chapter 6. Proverbs 17. I would say this is a very uh, instructive verse for technically fundamental Baptists. Okay? I don't like to call myself that. I don't like to take that title, that label. Um, but still, a lot of times, uh, especially when a church has a Christian school, that you're, you're busy, busy, busy doing things, okay? And sometimes we can get out of sort because we're too busy. Proverbs 17, verse 1 says, Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Okay, full of sacrifices under that context is going down to the Jewish temple all the time, doing another sacrifice, doing another sacrifice, doing this, doing this for the tabernacle, doing this for the temple, doing this for the high priest. And the guy was so frustrated because he'd go back home because so many things were undone because he wouldn't do things at home and they'd have strife in the home. And the Lord saying here in this context, you need to get rid of some of that stuff to take care of some of this stuff. And fundamental Baptists don't like that idea, especially if they got somebody that they you know, want their big show to go on, okay? The Lord wants your big show to go on, your family. Several years ago, if you would, also Galatians 6, uh, we, were, we were the, uh, Janet and I decided to be part of Bill Gothard's homeschool movement. We, were, we got into it on the, sixth, on the third year uh, when he started it. So we were the, of the third class, I guess you could call that, and so every once in a while, they'd have uh, a get-together seminar, or I guess you could call it. Uh, they would uh, have it at Knoxville, Tennessee, when we would go. And you would have about 15,000 people show up. Moms, dads, grandparents, kids. And a um, certain night, they'd have about 3,000 young people sing. I mean, it was great. Okay, but you're going there, say, Monday and you're going on and on and on and on Friday, and then you're going, oh, man, we're happy. No, you're tired to death. <laughs> okay, and then they had, um, they'd have father-son campouts. So I took Dad up. We went up to the North Woods. And then, they'd, again, we'd go Monday, Tuesday, and they'd have all these classes and seminars. And it's like, hey, if I'm going camping, I want to stay in the woods <laughs> myself. And so they had, uh, again, 13 sessions at that time, and I think I took Dad to two of them. I was a naughty boy. I, I only went to two of them, and in fact, one of them, about 10 minutes into it, a guy got correct in a book, and I just looked at Dad. I said, ready to go? <laughs> You'd walk out. I said, sure thing. Let's go. <laughs> we walked out. <laughs> okay, and in the Knoxville, Tennessee one, we were camping, had a campground, and so... Uh, there's a fellow camping next to us. He was part of the homeschool thing. And on Wednesday, he pulled me to the side, and he just said to me, he said, your family seems very content. What's your secret? And I said, well, I don't give me anything. And uh, I was just kind of joking around, and the guy said, no, I'm serious. I said, well, what's your problem? And he said, well, we go to this, and we go to this, and we go to this. And I said, sounds like to me you're going to all these seminars how to raise a family, and you don't got a time to raise a family. I said, forget the seminars, or at least be very selective. And at that time, I first was given uh, Mike Pearl's book, To Train Up a Child, and I said, here, read this. <laughs> and uh, he was so flustered on this on a Wednesday that he was just packing up, and he was going home, North South Carolina. And so before he left, he took that book with him, and he's reading the book outlined to, to his wife on the way home, he got so excited about some of the things he's reading and the changes that he needed to make, 
he decided he's going to drive clear back to Knoxville just to say thank you to me for giving him the book. Now, he could have called, but he didn't have a number, but I don't know. Uh, but the idea was is that you can't get too involved in these things. you got to get away from some things, especially to raise your family. Okay, and hopefully he continued that. He figured it out. And I'm not saying it's not, it's not bad to go to these seminars. People do need them. But there is a balance on these things. You can't have too much of sitting on your rump listening how to do something. You need to start doing it instead of being told how to do it. Do it. Learn from it. In Galatians 6, verse 10, this is a, a, a verse we just need to practice with each other. He says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them who are of the household of faith. Okay? Just do that. Now, there are, so, there are so many unsung heroes in the Bible, okay? And I just want to run through a few of them, about, I don't know, 70 or 80 of them. And so we'll just take time and, you know, just hit two minutes on each of them. So that'll be about, you know, whatever. So about 3 o'clock, we should be done. Uh, one is Ruth. Now, the only reason we know about Ruth is because the Bible gave her four chapters. But what was Ruth like? life like what did she do she took her opportunity to take care of one person her ex-mother-in-law or her i'm sorry her mother-in-law her husband died father-in-law died they went back to bethlehem judah and she was taking care of a bitter woman how what an unsung hero that is right naomi was bitter so what did ruth do she was gleaning during barley harvest. Okay, if you weren't raised on a farm, don't know anything about that. Barley is like wheat. It looks like wheat. Usually harvest a little bit before wheat. Usually you don't have it around here. It's usually up in the colder climates. And so to harvest barley in her time, you'd go out and take a sickle, and you'd take that little part of the barley, the plants you got, and stack them up. Another one. Stack them up and get a nice little stack of the barley there and then you let it air dry a little bit okay then you come back and you grab those little uh the, the group that you got there and then stomp it out and then blow on it or put it in front of a fan and then the barley little seeds would uh, end up there she was gleaning that wasn't the main harvest that means that she comes after the guys harvested hoping to find something that they missed if you're doing corn you just hit the end rows Okay, you find a lot of ears of corn in there. But barley, oh, yeah. She would take all day long, look in Ruth chapter 2, verse 17, and it, till the evening, and evening it says that she would collect an ephah of barley. Now, how much is that? Well, part of a homer of barley. Isn't that real help? An ephah is a certain part of a homer. Okay, uh, if you run the calculations, an ephah of barley is three-fifths of a bushel. Like a bushel of corn, a bushel of wheat go, fits into two five-gallon buckets. So three-fifths, six percent, or six, uh, sixty percent, so you get a six-gallon bucket. So you get one with a little bit taller, a six-gallon bucket, go out into a barley field, and on the corners of this barley field, she had cheerleaders. And cheerleaders were going, rah, rah, go, Ruth, go, Ruth, get that barley, get that barley. I mean, it was sag, bag, and drag. By the end of the day, she'd come home, and then she had to get the barley seeds out of the husk and everything. And she would get three-fifths of a bushel to help support a bitter woman. And God honored her for that. Yeah, put that on kids nowadays. You can't get uh, kids to detail some corn anymore. They won't go out there and do that. And, they, and, then, and then Americans complain about the Mexicans kind of doing that work. Well, then you do the work if you don't like it. <laughs> but no, Ruth quietly served her mother-in-law. Quietly. Now, we don't know the rest of the story we, as far as Ruth and her mother-in-law, but her mother-in-law 
Obviously, as nature took its course, got old. And I highly doubt that Ruth stuck her someplace, just let somebody else take care of her. I bet you Ruth took care of her all the way to her death. And God did not forget her labor of love. There's another fellow named Barzillai. You ever hear of that guy? You ever hear anybody preach about him? Barzillai. Barzillai was a guy that uh, when David was a fugitive of the law and all the post offices, Saul had put up David's picture and all the FBI and the KGB, they were all looking for David, trying to find him. And Barzillai knew that David was hiding out in a certain uh, woods, a certain wilderness. They didn't have surveillance cameras out there. They didn't know about that. So he would go out there and he had enough food and provisions for David and his mighty men for around 600 to 1,000 people. I mean, he didn't take that in a sack lunch. He took that in a chariot of some type, in some type of wagons out there. I mean, you talk about sticking your neck out. And if Saul and them found out what Barzillai did, he would, his picture would show up in a, in a post office. And Barzillai did that for David. David did not forget that. When David became king, he said, Barzillai, I want you to, I want you to come to the kingdom and I'll take care of you. He said, man, I am over 80 years old. I cannot taste all your fancy meats. It doesn't matter to me. I'm an old guy. I don't want to do that. I don't want your money anyway. Just leave me alone. But David wanted to take care of him. When David died, or right before his death, he told Solomon, I want you to take care of Barzillai. It's a blessing that David did not forget about him. A lot of people forget about people that helped him along the way. You see, there's another fellow. Do you remember the name of the fellow that helped Elisha? Of course, we don't remember the name. Gehazi. Gehazi was a fellow that helped Elisha. And Naaman uh, had leprosy, and Naaman's little, uh, little maid, a Jewish maid that he'd gotten from a battle. And Naaman had leprosy, and a little Jewish maid said, Hey, my prophet take care of you. Your church stinks, but mine sure better than yours. And my prophet could take care of that. He could heal you. And so Naaman sent messengers over to Elisha. And Elisha said, ah, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman said, I ain't going to do that. I'm a big shot. No way. And one of his under soldiers said, why don't you just do what he said? Can't hurt. So he did. And he did a natural thing after he got healed. He wanted to shower all these gifts and clothes and everything to Elisha. And Elisha said, don't want it. Don't care. Keep it. And then Gehazi his understudy, his helper, his unsung hero, eh, man, I'd kind of like to get some of that, a little recognition. So he secretly, he secretly went to Nahum and said, Elisha changed his mind. He'd, he'd like to have that anyway. Now, Elisha had the best surveillance program anybody could have. It was called the Spirit of God. And he said to Gehazi when he got back, he said, Gehazi, man, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. We got by without it. You didn't need to do that. But that's a temptation often that we have of somebody that doesn't, that serves behind the scenes. Like get a little compensation here and there. And Elisha said, the Lord says, you get tag, you're it, you get the leprosy. That's a pretty rough thing. But he continued to serve even with the leprosy. So he learned his lesson. So that's a good thing, Gehazi. There's another fellow that helped Jeremiah. Do you know the fellow, name of the fellow that helped Jeremiah? When Jeremiah was in a prison, he'd say to this guy, he said, I want you to write this thing down, and I want you to take it to the king. Do you know who that guy goes? No, we don't know who that is. Why? Unsung hero. A guy named Baruch. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah's in jail. He say, Baruch, come on in here. He said, I want you to write them some things down, and I want you to take these over to the such and such place. And Baruch did what he was told. Unsung hero. And Baruch, if you would, look in, in Jeremiah 45. God decides to give a selective message to one person. So the Spirit of God intercepted the mail, so we get to read somebody else's mail and get away with it. Jeremiah 45. And it is the temptation that the Lord is telling Baruch, yeah, I know you're tempted. You're an unsung hero. You're behind the scenes. Everybody knows about Jeremiah. Nobody knows about you. Jeremiah 45, 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch, the son of Neriah. When he had written these words in a book of the mouth of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus said the Lord, 
the God of Israel under the Obaruk. Man, I can't say that. We can't say that. Look at it. He's got his own private message. Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my signs. I find no rest. He said, I know you said that. I know inside you're really hurting. You're, I know that. You're, you, you're thinking things are going to be bad. I know I can read your mind. He said, Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up even this whole land. He said, I'm going to do what I said. Seekest thou great things for thyself? I, he, I know that's a temptation. I know it is. He said, You trying to seek some great things for yourself? Seek them not. Just don't worry about it. For, behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord, but thy life will I give Unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. He said, you get, man, you're living your life. I mean, he gave him a blessing because of that. Baruch quietly served Jeremiah, and God did not forget his labor of love. There was another fellow in Jeremiah's life. You probably don't remember his name. An Ethiopian guy that went to the king and said, Jeremiah's like to die. He's going to die down there, king. Would you let me get him out of there? Okay, go ahead. And Ebed Melech. Remember that name? Ebed Melech. What a name. Put that down. Ebed. Ebed Melech. He went and found these bed sheets. And he went to that dungeon where Jeremiah was down in the mire. And he let that bed sheet down. He said, hey, Jeremiah, he said, put that on your arm. We'll pull you on up. And he pulls him up out of there. And God had a selective message for Ebed later on. Ebed Melech, if you were looking for him in Jeremiah 39, verse 16. And he gets a selective message. Behind the scenes, the media is not going to report it. Nobody preaches about him in the Christian schools. Nobody knows about Ebed. He says, go speak to Ebed Melech. The Ethiopian saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil. Just like he told Baruch. He said, It's happening, man. It's happening. He says, And not for good. And they shall be accomplished in the day before thee. But I will deliver thee in that day. Saith the Lord, And thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom thou art afraid. He said, I know you're afraid. I know it. I know you're afraid them guys are out there, that whole army's out there for 18 months, they're going to be out there. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. That's Ebed. There's a couple in the New Testament, a guy that helped out uh, Paul. How about this name? If you would, look in first, second Timothy, second Timothy chapter 1. Onesiphorus. You ever hear anybody preach about Onesi? Onesiphorus. And that's if I'm pronouncing it right. When we get to heaven, he'll probably tell me how to pronounce it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Now, Paul, he's amazing. Paul, in that, he took a whole chapter in Romans 16, and he wrote about several of the unsung heroes in his life. He wrote about several of them. Paul did not forget them. That tells you and I, don't forget the people that helped you out. Don't forget them. 2 uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. Paul said, everybody left me. Of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Okay, both those guys left me. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Nesiphorus. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. What day? In that day. What day is he talking about? Judgment seat of Christ. That's where the rewards are given. That's where the Lord will not forget our labor of love. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. And then if you go to the last chapter, chapter 4, verse 19, not only was it Onesiphorus doing these things for Paul, it was Mrs. and all his kids. They were all involved. 
Second Timothy four nineteen. Salute Priscilla and Aquila, the household Onesiphorus. All of them got involved with that. Now there's somebody else mentioned there, Priscilla and Aquila. Those two people, husband and wife team, no, never mentioned of the kids. Those two people lived in Rome, and then Claudius booted out all the Jews out of Rome. Acts 18, verse 1, 2, and 3. So here goes Aquila and Priscilla, probably heartbreaking, leaving all their friends in Rome, and they're getting booted out, and they're going down to Israel. And while they're down there, coincidentally, they came across Paul's path. They were all tent makers, and they said, Paul, why don't you stay at our house? And they became unsung heroes in the life of Paul. They had a, ho- a church in their own house. Luke, uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 4 and 5 writes about that. They actually discipled a fellow named Apollos and sat him down and showed him some more things in the way of the Lord, just quietly, unsung, sat at a table, probably sat in a little restaurant there in Israel and went over some scriptures with Apollos. And, and he got more sound in the faith And Aquila and Priscilla. And I bet you, when they look back on it, they say, boy, do you remember when we were so heartbroken when we had to leave Rome, man? God, we got kicked out of Rome. Can you imagine what they did? And we just didn't know how that was going to happen. Now we look back and we see that God had his finger in everything. And at the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to rake it in. They're going to get all these rewards. Why? Because there's a God in heaven that will not forget our labors of love. He won't forget it. I don't know about you, but that's a big encouragement to me because a lot of times behind the scene things nobody sees, but there's a God in heaven that's writing down, keeping track. And those quiet things that often that kids do for their parents and hope you do these things for your parents, quietly serve your parents, obey them, do what you can. The Lord is keeping track of those things. Behind the scenes, unsung heroes, faithfully, grabbing on to those routine things of life and learning to enjoy them so we can be a blessing to God and to others. Okay, we'll stop and pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to see these many unsung heroes in the Bible and help us to be unsung heroes of, the, of Thee, that we might take the opportunities we've been given to uh, help others, to be a blessing to them, to be a blessing to our parents, to our friends, our brothers and sisters, our relatives to other believers. Help us to recognize that what we do behind the scenes, that you are keeping track, and God, you are not unrighteous. You will not forget our labors of love. We thank you for that. We rejoice in that. And the world says other things are exciting, but I'd say that's the most exciting. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.